Okay, all right, super. We are so thankful that you are here to worship our great God and Savior, the one who is coming again. That, uh, and we have that hope. We have that blessed hope. I'm so excited about that. This world is not our home. And as we do every week, we're going to read from Psalm uh, uh, 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expanse. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. And we have that opportunity to do that in song now. So let's stand as we sing.
chapter 1. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. To him be glory forevermore. Amen. This morning we're going to teach you a new song this morning uh, from Sovereign Grace and it's called Christ Our Treasure. And that, uh, again, is a response from what God has done for us, that He is our treasure.
justified us and declares us right before you we have the righteousness of Jesus and thank you and praise you it's not of ourselves but it's all that you, what you have done and because of that you have transformed us and you have made us new creations and new creatures in Christ that our desire is now that we want to love you and we want to treasure you with all of our heart and mind and soul and it's in Jesus' precious name we pray these things until he comes again. All of God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Yes, yeah. It's great to be together, isn't it? To worship with our brothers and sisters and hear the songs of praise being lifted up wanted to remind you as well that we'll be concluding our series tonight on why we're no longer with the EV Free Association, uh, doctrinally and, and uh, pr in practice. So I want you to come back tonight. Uh, Neil Zerlang, our chairman, will be speaking, um, and we will uh, let you know of some really, really important uh, items. So do, do make that a priority. Um, just so... So thankful. It's been a great week here at the church, and the Lord is, is blessing. We have uh, six new members that we'll be welcoming in person following the second service, which is great. Uh, Julianne Payne is one, and Charlotte uh, Bays. We also are going to be welcoming uh, Matt and Jamie Howard, as well as um, Justin and Betsy Milinich. So we are so grateful that the Lord is adding to us. And uh, these are wonderful people who love the Lord and uh, love this church and are going to be joining us in fulfilling the Great Commission here in Visalia as we do that together. I'd like to just continue uh, in an attitude of praise and thanksgiving. And then I'll read uh, a few verses in Acts chapter 4 and 5. And then I'll introduce the subject, when is it right to disobey human authorities? Let's, let's pray. Father, thank you uh, for being the, the father of the heavenly lights, the sun, the moon, and the stars all bow to you. You made them and you shined them for us. Lord, thank you for all the good gifts that you have given to us, even the perfect gift in your son, whom we worship and through whose word we have been born again unto a new life and a living hope. Lord, we are so thankful that of all people, uh, we have the most to praise you for, to thank you for, because through your son, we, we have you. And uh, we are your possession, purchased um, through the cross by the son. And forever, we will declare your greatness. We will proclaim uh, your glory uh, here in evangelism and in praise and forever in your presence when there's no more curse, no more suffering. And we are in perfect 
harmony with you and with one another. And we long for that day. We pray that you would cleanse us uh, from evil, that you would keep us from the evil one, that you would help us in our battle with temptation uh, to be able to uh, stand strong in the grace that's given us in Christ, grace that it is sanctifies and strengthens and enables us to stand in steadfast obedience. Strengthen believers today to stand. And if any have stumbled, Lord, may the, the, the eternal love of God shed abroad in their hearts by the Spirit, remind them that they are forever your child if they've been bought by the blood of Christ. Strengthen the body of Christ, we pray, each one. Lord, comfort the downtrodden and the hurting. Comfort the Damco family, Lord. Thank you for the outpouring of love that they've already received from our congregation. May that continue. May you protect uh, Doug as he travels with his family across the country. Bless that family and that trip. Lord, we we just want to celebrate Dave's life this week and just thank you for bringing him to baptism and to membership class. And um, I believe if he were here, he would be among those who would be welcomed into membership this very morning. But he's got a far greater, far greater um, place today in your presence. And we just thank you, Lord, for his life. And Father, we ask that as Christians, as citizens, we would know the mind of Christ. We would exercise the wisdom of God, the discernment given us by the Spirit and the Word, that we would make decisions that are right and proper in every situation. We pray all of this for Jesus' sake and for his glory. Amen. Amen. The question, when is it right to disobey human authorities, is a biblical question. In fact, if you go to Acts chapter 4, verses 19 and 20, it's the very question that John and Peter ask when they have been commanded to do the, uh, to, to not do what Jesus commanded them to do. The Sanhedrin says, don't preach in, in the name of Jesus. But Jesus said to them, go into all the world and preach. So they say in verse 19 of Acts 4, Peter and John answered and said to them, whether, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. You know, they were threatened, they were put into prison, they were mistreated and then Go to the next chapter when they're released and stand before the Sanhedrin a second time. And they say in verse 28 of chapter 5, we gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name. And yet you filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. See any double-mindedness, lack of confidence, uh, wavering conviction? These men knew exactly who they served and exactly what the God who saved them called them to. And so they say, with conviction, we must obey God rather than men. Our subject again, when is it right, even righteous, to disobey human authorities. And I think this will be a bit of a breather for us, considering we've heard at least four weeks about submission to human authorities. Well, this morning, we're going to talk about not submitting to human authorities. In fact, disobeying human authorities is the topic at hand. The question is asked, are all governing rulers to be viewed with uncritical acceptance and automatic approval? Does the government possess absolute authority? Or does that belong only to God? Can we use Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2, 13 as proof texts that teach that the state deserves our total and unquestioning obedience? Does submit mean obey? Does it mean obey in every case? Are there exceptions to Romans 13, verse 1, and 1 Peter 2? 
Can it be wrong to obey the government in some cases? And can it be our just moral obligation in certain cases to do as Peter and John did in Acts 5.29 against the highest governing body of the day, the Jewish Sanhedrin, and say to them, we will obey God, not you. So based just solely on Acts 5.29, that verse I just quoted, there is biblical precedent, as I mentioned, to obey God rather than to obey men. So how do we know when we're supposed to submit, as Romans 13.1 and 1 Peter 2 tell us, and when we are to stand and say, we must obey God? How do we know? Well, that's what we're going to learn this morning. And my hope is to lay out some principles for you that you can apply in every situation when dealing with a human authority, whether it be uh, a church leader, whether it be uh, a parent, whether it be uh, your boss or manager, whether it be a governing official, whether it be your husband or some other person in authority. First thing we need to recognize is the hierarchy of authority. The hierarchy of authority. That word hierarchy, just think, just think of a ladder, right? A ladder is a type of hierarchy. You have a top rung, right? And then you have all these other rungs that fall beneath the top one. Well, in a hierarchy of authority, you have one at the top rung who has absolute authority. And then there are the human authorities that come underneath. So we have a hierarchy of authority. There's also... Uh, the syllogism that I put in there, and a syllogism is just a fancy word for saying it's, it's a, uh, a mechanism to, to reason together. Two truthful statements followed by a conclusion, and the conclusion is based on those true statements. So the, the true statement number one is God alone has absolute authority. God alone has absolute authority. Truth statement number two, God has delegated authority to human institutions. And there I listed five of them based on 1 Peter 2 and Ephesians 6. Conclusion. Therefore, all human institutions have limited authority under God and are accountable to God for how they use or misuse their authority. To sum it up, God alone is on the top tier. All human institutions are bottom tier authorities. This is not to say human authorities do not have much authority. It is only to say human authority does not have as much authority as God does. That's what we need to never forget. God alone possesses all power. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. Remember... Of course, you remember that. And then I list for you some principles. The first two we're going to use a lot. The last one we may get to at the end if I can keep it moving. These are the principles for navigating the choppy waters of human authorities. This is principle number one is a review hierarchy of authority. It states that there's greater authority and there are lesser authorities. The overruling principle, principle number two, says this. As a Christian, whenever human authorities command you to disobey what God commands or command you to do or obey what God forbids, you must obey God rather than man because God, not man, is your greater authority. This is so liberating. This is so Liberating. Remember, the summation of all your word is truth, right? And so all the scripture has to be taken as one body of truth, and we have to interpret the parts with the whole. The overruling principle is what you saw in James or in Peter and John. They would not submit to the Sanhedrin, they would only submit to the Savior who had commissioned them to preach. And that's what they did. If we go to the Old Testament, we're going to find two more really good examples of the overruling principle. First is in Exodus chapter 1, and then we're going to look in Daniel chapter 3. This is some good Old Testament, and and the Old Testament is given to us for our instruction, 
so that through perseverance and encouragement from the scriptures, we would have hope. These narratives are real history and they're designed to instruct us and give us encouragement and give us hope. Well, here we're going to get hope from these two midwives named in this text. We're in Exodus chapter 1. Israel, the children of Israel is multiplying. They are multiplying faster than the Egyptians in whose land they are enslaved. And so Pharaoh works to reduce their numbers by working them to the bone, hoping that in doing that, he'll keep them weak. But it backfires. They continue to multiply and grow, and their numbers are like the stars in the heavens, as God told Abraham. They're innumerable. They keep growing and growing. And so, feeling the threat that these slaves might rebel or join in another nation against Egypt, the Pharaoh decides he needs to do something. So he chooses population control. Population control. And what he calls for is not an indiscriminate infanticide, just kill all the babies. No, he calls for what Marianne Warren refers to in her book, uh, gender side. He calls for gender side. We're going to wipe out the baby boys. So if the gender reveal is pink, then she lives. If it's blue, he dies. So what were the midwives to do when they are brought before Pharaoh? And we have two of them mentioned in chapter 1. Shifra and Pua in verse 15. They are likely not the only ones, but they are mentioned in the text by name as notable persons because they feared God more than they feared Pharaoh. Just to pick up um, the, the text there, it says, the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, verse 15, one of whom was named Shifra, and the other was named Pua. And he said, when you are helping the Hebrew women to give birth and see them upon the birth stool, if it is a son, then you shall put him to death. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. What are the midwives going to do? Given this edict by the Pharaoh to not let the boys live. Verse 17 tells us what they do. But the midwives feared God. And did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded them, but let the boys live. They fear God. What does God require but to love him and serve him and fear him? Fearing God is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs 1.7. Fearing God is linked to departing from evil, Proverbs 3.8. And fear of God is explained as hating evil, Proverbs 8, 13. Those who have destruction and misery in their paths do not know the fear of God. Pharaoh didn't know Joseph. He didn't know the God of Joseph. He just knew his own throne, his own power, his own nation, his own stability. These women were different. They feared God. That simply means they had more awe and reverence for God and his commands than they did for Pharaoh and his edicts. We can see part B of the overruling principle applied. If the human authority demands you do something God forbids, you're to obey God rather than man. In fact, they're questioned about this in verse 18. So the king of, e of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, why have you done this thing and let the boys live? The midwife said to Pharaoh, well, be it's because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife can get to them. <laughs> There's some strong women and they give birth fast. Now, mind you, these women are slaves. 
They're working. They're giving birth as they um, are, are rest, resting at the end of, 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 of hard labor. I think it's a true statement that the Hebrew women were vigorous, wouldn't you say? Imagine working as a slave, and the Bible says that they were harsh, they were cruel, they made the people miserable, and these women are giving birth, and they're multiplying, giving birth under those conditions. What do they tell women today? If you want to give birth, take some time off, relax, right? These, these, <laughs> these women, quite the opposite. Did she lie? Well, we're not exactly certain that she did. They did, that they did, rather. The narrator does not tell us if what they said was untrue. It simply reports what they said. It's likely there was more to the conversation than Moses recorded here in Exodus. It's possible they shrewdly delayed their arrival to the Hebrew women in labor, allowing for extra time for them to deliver their babies in safety. They may not have told the king everything that happened. We're just not told. But what was the outcome? That's the main question. Were they commended for their disobedience? Look at verse 20. God was good to the midwives. Remember, he's righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. If he was good to the midwives, shows his approval of their disobedience and his blessing on his people. The people multiplied, became very mighty because the midwives feared God. The midwives were God's agents in fulfilling his promise to Abraham that he would make of him a great nation and that they'd be as innumerable as the stars in the heavens. In her helping those midwives fulfill the creation mandate, which is to be fruitful and multiply, they were working with, not working against the plan of God. Now, isn't that good to know? Isn't that good instruction? Isn't that good encouragement? Doesn't that give us hope that there are people who fear God and they're going to obey God, even if it means disobeying the highest most powerful human authority in the nation. Now I'm going to give you a little parable. Just imagine this. The year is 2015, and you are a midwife or an, or an OB. You're in the country of China. You're operating under a one-child policy law. And your services are called upon by a Chinese woman pregnant with her second child. You know it's against the law to have a second child in urban China. What are you going to do? You recognize that if the, this child is born, the family could face anywhere from $370 to $12,800 in fees. And that sum is beyond the average family's ability to pay. You know furthermore that since this one child policy began in 1979, 400 million births have been prevented. You know that even the Chinese government acknowledges the problem and has expressed concern about the tens, listen, of millions of young men who will not be able to find brides. And Furthermore, they're aware that they may turn to kidnapping women, sex trafficking, and other forms of crime. In 2020, there's 30 million unwed men without Chinese girls to choose from as a wife. So what do you do? Do you help the women to give birth? Or do you encourage her to do something different? This is the question. What does the crossover principle say? It says, no human institution is completely autonomous or can function solely on its own, independent of God or the other human institutions. This means that government does not have absolute authority over 
all people in all cases. The question the believer needs to ask is this, who gave the law or the command to reproduce? God or the government? Answer, God. To whom? So is, is the government justified in forcing a one-child policy, even if they support it for reasons such as uh, poverty, food shortage, and starvation? Is that policy justified before God? Answer, no. God gave the gift of reproduction not to the government, but to the married unit to be governed by husband and wife. It is a family matter. It is not a government matter. So the midwife, if she is a Christian, or the OB, if he's a Christian and they're functioning under biblical authority, they would work to help this family have their second child. Genesis chapter 1, God created, uh, God created male and female in the image of God. He created them, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. God gave that to the married couple, and so the authority for that privilege rests at the level of the family, not at the level of government. Somebody may ask, well, pastor, is it wrong to use birth control? Is it wrong for a Christian to use birth control? The Bible does not forbid the use of birth control. But God does stand against the annihilation of a conceived egg, right? Any birth control pill that can allow for contraception and then rejects or destroys the conceived egg by thinning the wall of the uterus at the time of conception, making the survival of that new embryo impossible, that's murder. My dear wife, when we were first married, went on Depravera, which is a, a birth control, and she was told that there's no possible way that conception could occur. Two years later, after doing some research, she realized she had received misinformation. She got off of that. I say that to say, do your homework if you use birth control. Life is in the hands of God. It is his gift. He gives it and he takes it. It is his authority, not the government's. It is between him and the married couple. That's his ideal plan. Now, if a baby is born out of wedlock or through, through some sin, that is of no um, bearing on that child. That is, the child obviously was free from the circumstances of their birth, and God blesses uh, that birth and that child, and that child is made in his image. I just figured I'd put that in there because these are things we need to think about. And I don't want this pulpit to be a place where we only talk about things that are nice. We have to talk about everything. Second illustration, Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. You have the three young Hebrews in chapter 1, verse 6. Hannah, Hanai, sorry, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Remember them? They're more commonly known as what? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yes. Chapter 1, verse 6. We have Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, the sons of Judah. They are in Babylon. Remember, Israel had to pay for their failure to honor uh, the, the Sabbath. And they went 70 years uh, into captivity in Babylon, which is modern Iraq. So the year is 587, it's just prior to the time that uh, Jerusalem will, will fall. And the government is going to command 
what God forbids. You have, a, uh, at this point, an unconverted, power-crazy ruler named Nebuchadnezzar. He's ruling in Babylon, and at the time in history, and I looked this up this morning to be double sure, he is, he is ruling over a city that's population is in excess of 200,000. It was the largest population of an ancient city up to its time. This is a renowned ruler. And he makes a, or he has a ginormous image of himself erected. It's a colossal statue standing nine stories tall, about 90 feet above the ground. Mind you, a standard utility pole is about 40 feet. This is twice that height. And it is an obelisk of himself. Maybe he had gotten that from the, um, the pharaohs that had similar obelisks built in honor of their own image. However, it's likely that he had this built after hearing that he was the golden head in the image of this enormous statue that he, he, dream, he dreamed about and had Daniel interpret for him. You remember? It, had, it was gold, it was silver, it was bronze, it was iron. And he was told that him, himself, was, he himself was the golden head. And so he erects then an image to himself overlaid with gold. As he is the head uh, of a world empire at the time. That vision would show that Persia and Greece and Rome would follow. And then Christ would eventually crush them all. So in, in, in Daniel 3, we have this area the plain of Dura, which means an open area surrounded by mountains in the providence of Babylon. And notice uh, verse 2, he mentions eight classes of governing officials. So this is like the, this is Nebuchadnezzar and his cabinet, his team. They're mentioned in verse 2. The king sent word to the satraps, prefects, governors, counselors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. So this is his officials. The satraps were chief representatives of the king. The prefects were military commanders. The governors were civil administrators. The treasurers obviously administered the funds. The judges administered the law. The magistrates passed judgment in the keeping with the law. And others were subordinate to these, writes Dwight Pentecost. Here's what happens. Verse 4, the herald loudly proclaimed to you the command is given, O peoples, nations, and men of every language, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you're to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And he's wanting to bring order and unity to his empire. To bring all who were there, all the residents, whether they be foreign or, or, or born there, there to bow. Notice the threat. Verse 6. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast in the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And you know the story, right? If you grew up in church and your parents read you children's stories... Then there were, amidst this crowd of tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands, these three recalcitrant young men. And they're standing while everyone else is bowing. And you know the story. They are brought to the king. The king gives them a second chance. They say, we don't even need to have a conversation about a second chance because we are not bowing will burn before we bow. And so that's exactly what happened. They are thrown in to the furnace after it's heated seven times hotter, killing the guards that came close to it. And what we find is that Nebuchadnezzar stands in awe because at his first count, there were three. Upon later counting, he finds four in the fire. And the fourth is described as a son of a deity. 
a divine one. A divine one. That could be our Lord Jesus himself. But what I want you to see in verses 17 and 18. In this conversation, just prior to them being tossed into the furnace, notice the faith of these three Hebrews in the power of God to deliver them. Verse 17. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able. See that? Is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, notice their submission now to the sovereign will of God. Let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So whether our God rescues us and we live or we suffer martyrdom and die, that's a secondary matter. The point is we're not bowing. It's easy to make decisions when you know for whom you serve and for whom you live. And you know Verse 26 tells us that this pagan king could not help but notice that these men were servants of the greatest God. Verse 26, he came near to the door of the furnace and responded, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out. Notice this, you servants of the most high God. That's a name to, that describes his greatness. The king had just said, who will be able to deliver you out of my hand? And now he says, you servants of the most high God. That term is only used outside of the Psalms by a non-Jew in honor of the greatness of the true God. This doesn't indicate that he worshiped God. It just indicates that he recognized the greatness of the God of these Hebrews. So what did they do? They were a testimony and a witness. Notice how he commends them in verse 28. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who put their trust in him, violating the king's command, and yielded up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any god except their own god. This guy thinks he's a god. He erects a statue to himself. He calls the people to worship the statue. And then at the end, he acknowledges the god of these disobedient Hebrews. What, what an awesome turn of events, is it not? This is, this is the faith of our fathers, dear ones. These are those who have gone before and conquered kingdoms, performing acts of righteousness. What did Peter say? Have your conduct honorable among the pagans. So when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by the good works which they observe, glorify God on a day of visitation. Oh, wow. The overruling principle. Whenever human authority commands you to disobey what God commands or commands you to obey what God forbids, you must obey God rather than man because God, not man, is your greater authority. Now, what's going to happen in the tribulation when Antichrist worship becomes the global religion and everyone will be forced to a decision? Worship Antichrist and live or reject Antichrist and die. That's exactly what the world is going to face. You have a small microcosm of that in Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar in one city at one time. But once Babylon, Revelation Babylon takes place and the city of man is erected and the worship of man with the number 666, the number of man in the day of man is called for man to worship man. What will those believing ones in the tribulation do? You know, Christians ask today about the mark of the beast. I've heard that question many a time. 
Pastor, if you take the mark of the beast, does that mean you're going to go to hell? If you take the mark of the beast, does that mean you're, you're damned? Can you take the mark and still be a believer? Well, if you look at the passages where the mark is mentioned, it's in the context of worshiping the Antichrist. So the better question to ask is not, is it okay to take the mark? The question we need to be asking is, is it okay to worship Antichrist? And if the answer to that, as we all know, is no, then the mark is irrelevant. We're going to die anyway if we're alive in the tribulation period and are not worshiping the Antichrist. Unless, like Revelation 12 says, we're part of that remnant that the Lord himself preserves through the tribulation. Is there a one world economy coming? Oh, there is. Listen to what David Jeremiah says about the mark. He says it's notable that the word mark is translated from the Greek karagma. It was a symbol. The karagma was a symbol used somewhat like a notary seal is used today. And I quote, the symbol consisted of a portrait of the emperor and the year of his reign. It was required to complete commercial transaction and was stamped in wax on official documents to authenticate their validity. The mark of the beast will function in a similar way. It will identify those who bear it as worshipers of the beast, permitting them to conduct financial transaction. Now notice this. The fusion, writes David Jeremiah, of government and religion will put the squeeze on rebels, leaving them nowhere to turn. Those who refuse the mark will be shut out of society altogether. No one will buy their products or services. They'll be barred from employment and from shopping in stores or online. They'll face bankruptcy and starvation. He then concludes this way. The Bible is clear that Satan's intent is not only to keep them from means of survival, but also to force them to a decision. Will they stand for Christ, refusing the mark despite the hardship promised, or will they succumb to the loyal demands of Satan and take on the mark to relieve that hardship. The issue is, am I a Jesus worshiper or an idol worshiper? If you've got that question answered and you know who you worship, you don't have to worry about the mark. You don't have to worry about the Antichrist. You don't have to worry about anything because he will save to the uttermost those who have faith in him. Revelation 13, once the second beast deceives the world to worship the first beast uh, and then gives the threat, whoever doesn't will be, will be killed, then the mark is introduced as necessary in order to buy and sell. In other words, it's necessary in order to survive. What will happen to those who worship the beast? Revelation 14.9 is very clear. Revelation 14.9. The angel says with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, again, mark and beast worship are tied together. He also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And he'll be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego wouldn't bow to man. When the tribulation comes, true believers will not bow to the man Antichrist. They will see him as a false Christ. They'll see his prophet as a false prophet. They'll see the signs of the prophet as false signs, and they will worship only Jesus. And you know, John ends his letter, dear children, Having already spoke about Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist, he says, keep yourselves from idols. What would it take for you to not stand firm for Jesus? What, would, what, would, what, what threat would be enough to topple you to give in to worship some other idol? Saint, we... We are to have no other gods before him. We are to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. To love our neighbor as ourselves. We are to guard our hearts that he remains. Not only the one true God, but the one and only. The pressures from government are going to increase. 
The pressures against religion are going to increase. Christian, Jew, Catholic, all, all alike, but we, we, we will have it the hardest. So what are the guidelines? We could keep this in mind. Resist a government that commands or compels evil and work nine violently with the laws of the land to change a government that permits evil. Vote, petition, use every legal, peaceful means to have righteous rulers. And don't say, I just don't know who to vote for, so I'm not going to vote. Secondly, civil disobedience is permitted when the government's law or commands are in direct violation of God's laws and commands. Third, if a Christian disobeys an evil government, unless he can flee from the government, he should accept that government's punishment for his actions. Just like the three Hebrews were willing to be thrown in the fire. And John and Peter were, be, were willing to be flogged and thrown into prison. Because actions have consequences. And we need to be ready to face them. Fourthly, Christians are certainly permitted to work to install new government leaders within the laws that have been established. These are four guidelines for Christian civil disobedience based on an article that I recommend called When is Civil Disobedience Allowed for a Christian? GotQuestions.org. Great website. When is Civil Disobedience Allowed for a Christian? And I thought in, the, in just the time remaining, just to review, there's a hierarchy of authority. Not all authorities are equal. God alone has absolute authority. God has delegated authority to human institutions, government among others, like the church, the boss, the marriage, the family. These are all bottom rung institutions. The conclusion, therefore, is that all human institutions have limited authority under God and are accountable to God for how they use or misuse their authority. In the case when you're forbidden to do what God commands, you must obey God rather than man. And in the case where you are commanded to do what God forbids, you're to obey God rather than man. We've heard this many times who've been trained over at the Master's Seminary. When uh, Pastor MacArthur began there in 1969, he read Matthew 18 from the Bible, where it says that members are to take care of other members, and we are to care for one another, and at times it involves correction and confrontation. So he brought this to his elder board, and, and he got pushed back. They said, well, we, we shouldn't do church discipline. It'll empty the church. It'll drive people away. It'll be a disaster. God commands, if your brother sins, go to him. That's what God says. But man, in his sensibilities and his fear and his cowardice, says, well, that's not going to work. That won't be successful. That'll be a disaster. Praise God, Pastor MacArthur. He said, I, I didn't know any other church that would, would stand on the word of God on this, on this issue. And he said, in standing where Jesus stood, not only did the church not empty, it multiplied. Why? Because God's word is true. His principles are right. They're protective. They're pure. They're lovely. And people, adults are just like kids. They feel secure when they know where the boundaries are. And they feel protected when they know that there's repercussions for misbehavior. We should and must do church discipline. Well, pastor, what if I'm at a church and my, my pastor won't do church discipline? He won't speak about divorce or homosexuality or transgender issues or really anything that's controversial. What am I supposed to do? I'll tell you what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to go to him with an open Bible and do Matthew 18 and tell him that he is under obligation to teach the whole counsel of God. And if he hears you, you've won your brother. If he doesn't, you either leave and go somewhere else or you go to the fellow leadership. This is authority that God has given to the church. Sir, ma'am, what if you're in another town, you're traveling with uh, colleagues and your, your manager invites you to uh, a lewd dining venue or a lewd movie that you know is going to defile you? and is going to destroy your witness and quench the spirit, what do you do? This person's in, this is your boss. This is somebody, what do you do? 
Do you lose face? Maybe lose that promotion opportunity? Maybe even lose favor? Do you lose your life and find it in Christ? Or do you obey man rather than God? Overruling principle. He's commanding you to do what God forbids. So I can't do it. It come what may. I can't do it. That should be the response. Well, what if your, your husband's commanding you, pastor, to, to uh, not read the Bible and not attend church, and you're a born-again believer? Well, 1 Peter 3 is very clear. Your husband is not your highest authority. Your husband is a second-rung, bottom-tier authority. And so, you're, as 1 Peter 3 says, meekly, quietly, respectfully, yet creatively, read your Bible. And, not forsa- and do not forsake the assembling with other saints. Why? Because your human authority is c- commanding you to do what God, or, or is, commanding, is forbidding you to do what God commands. And therefore, you're to obey God rather than man because God, not man, is your highest authority. And when it says, ladies, in 1 Peter 3, that he'll be one without a word, that doesn't mean you don't tell him the gospel. What Peter is saying is that these men have already heard the gospel and they're disobedient to the word. They've rejected the gospel. They know the gospel. So don't preach at them and nag them. Be respectful and courteous. Be a gentle, quiet person and follow the beautiful character of God in your manner, but do what God calls you to do as much as you can. This is the last one and we're done. Crossover principle. Here's the one illustration for a crossover principle. I think it's very close to home. The crossover principle on your note says, no human institution is completely autonomous and can function solely on its own, independent of God or the other human institutions. So right now in the state of Delaware, I have a pastor friend there, it's illegal to spank your child. So what does a Christian parent do? When the scripture says in Proverbs 13, 24, if you withhold discipline from your son... You hate your child. How do you get around that? Notice the proverb addresses your son. So who is, who is the subject in that proverb? Is it the government? Or is it the parent? It's the parent. So every text has a context for a reason. The government gave the sword to the government to restrain evil. He gave the rod to parents to restrain evil in their own home. So because God gave the rod to parents and not the government, the government cannot interfere with the parents' responsibility before God to raise their children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now with that, there's a however. What if... An enraged parent, in their righteous anger, turns that tool of discipline into a weapon of destruction. And instead of paddling the behind, smashes the face. Then, my friend, both the government and the church have responsibility to come and intervene on behalf of that child. You see, the family is not an island unto itself. It is subject to the church and it is subject to the government. The government is not an island unto itself. It is subject to God and it is subject to the family and it is subject to the church. These are all realms of authority that have to relate in the ways that God has ordained under his authority structure. The church says Matthew 18, and under law would need to make a phone call to CPS in a case like that. Friend, the nations rage against Christ and against, his, against God and against his anointed. We are those who, have, who are declaring to the world that there is another king, and his name is Jesus. Uncle Sam's not supreme. Even the church is not ultimately supreme. 
It is Christ and Christ alone. And so our submission comes in marriage, husband and wife, wives, follow your husbands as they follow Christ. Submit as you submit to Christ. If, you, if, if submitting to your husband means not submitting to Christ, then you can't submit to your husband and you deal with the consequences. God honors that. It's the same at work. It's the same in the family. It's the same in the church. We give to Caesar what's Caesar's and to God what's God's. Next week, we're going to look at what happens when the government forbids you to do what God commands. Father, I pray that you would go before us, that you would enlighten our minds and our hearts, help us to engage with our friends this week and our spouses, our, our small group about these matters. This is the first time in the history of our country that we are compelled to think deeply about when it is right to disobey the government. Help us to see in matters of life, conception and birth, we're to obey God rather than men. In matters of worship, we're to obey God rather than men. In matters of the family, we're to obey God rather than men. Give us discernment to know how to apply these principles in every situation and may each one feel that the word of the Lord is perfect. It is the perfect law of freedom. And if anyone has not submitted to the sovereign king, bowed low before Jesus as a humble, broken lawbreaker seeking rest for his soul or her soul, may they find mercy at the cross and the empty tomb of our Lord Jesus. May they turn from sin and trust Christ alone as Lord and Savior and be delivered from the present evil age. Draw sinners, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. We'll come back next week for the part two and maybe part three, and we're going to have an exciting series together. Make sure you greet one another. And I encourage you to make, make a return tonight and see the conclusion, experience the conclusion of that series. God bless you.